Father, to me, there's no more encouraging thing than that, to know that we are walking, Father, with the presence of your Spirit within our life. Father, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. May we live our life according to that. And Father, we'll give you the praise. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when we journey down the narrow path, many times there's hindrances along the way. Now, I don't know about you, but as I walk this path, I see them all the time. You know, and the thing of it is, once you think you've defeated one, another one pops up. You know, you, you always have that one that's going to stand in your path. And you always have that sin that's so easily going to beset you. But I believe that in a, and when we walk with Christ and we're allowing him to take full control of our life, then we will take these things and apply them in a different way. We will apply them to learn and not just to, to endure. And to me, that's the thing. I, I don't want to endure life. I want to walk this life knowing that I can have victory. Now, sometimes that victory is hard, and sometimes it don't seem like we can make it. But I believe that God created us for the, for the conflict. He created us for victory. And if I can believe that every single day, I can walk forward knowing that I can succeed. I don't have to look at past failures. And the devil's real good at throwing those past failures into your life. At least he is to me. Because I look at all the things I failed in my life. And he'll bombard you with one after another, after another, after another. Until you get to the point he says, you're nothing. But I just look at him and call him a liar. And I call him a liar. Because God said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And because of that, I can go forward. I've been renewed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, I can stand no matter what he puts into this brain. So through that, I know that the, the things that come into my life, I can step over. I can hurdle them. When I was young, I, I was a pole holder in, in uh, I guess, the eighth, seventh, eighth grade. I loved doing that. Man, that was fun. But I was too little to bend the pole. So I had to stiff arm that thing over all the time. So I couldn't go as high as everybody else. But that was okay. I loved doing it. It was a lot of fun. But you learned how to hurdle over something. You learn how to jump to where you can take that leap and get over whatever's in front of you. And when we can walk this life like that, we can vi have victory. And I believe there's one thing in our lives that stand out in this path. There's one thing that separates us so many times from the Lord, and that's distractions. This is something that I've seen for a long, long time in people. We get distracted, distracted by the things of the world. You know, we talked about this earlier, about how many people would be here because it's a holiday. I'm all right with that. You know, I mean, we need those times away, and I'm not saying we got to be in church every single week. But I also got to worry when somebody just misses to miss, because then where's your priority? Because that then becomes a distraction. It's a distraction to keep us from where we need to be. But the distractions in our life will always creep in. They will always come into a place where we wonder where I need to be and what's the most important thing I have to live for. Distractions is what many times people live for because those are the places they put themselves into so-called pleasure. I like what John Bloom says. He says, since the fall of man, people have had trouble staying focused. But we live today in an age of unprecedented distractions. Each day we are bombarded with the temptations to be distracted by things, some good distractions, and they are often insignificant. That's a great statement and so true. We live in a world where people are so distracted by many things. Just watch people drive sometimes and, whoa, didn't want to do that. Distraction. But you see people driving down the road and they're playing with their phone. You know, they're playing on their phone and, and they're weaving all over the road. And that drives me crazy. If you can't play on your phone and keep your car straight, get off your phone. That's the way I look at it. Distractions. Doesn't matter how big they are or how little, those distractions can kill you. In the realm of eternity, many times these distractions mean nothing. They mean, don't mean anything. So why bother with them? If it's not affecting my eternity, it's not of much good to me. And that's the way I look at this thing. If it's not giving me a benefit to get me to heaven, then what's the point? Now, I'm not saying we can't have fun and we can't do these things. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is, is if we put more emphasis on that, then we are Christ. That's a distraction. And that distraction is going to do what it's meant to do. And that's pull me from where I need to be. That's going to pull me from Christ. 
The places we see the distractions the most is in our spiritual life. And I know this because I fight it every day as well. And I've talked to enough of you to know you fight the same thing. But how many times have we sat down to pray and our mind wonders a hundred million places? Man, I get mad about that. I get so mad at that. And there are things that mean absolutely nothing. Nothing. I get so frustrated about that. There's a stuff called focusing. Or, oh, it's not focusing. Oh, now my mind went. Centering. It's called centering. It's a way of prayer. Now, the Catholic Church started this years back, and it took a lot of flack. But I got to reading about it, and I wanted to know more about it. And I think it's a good thing to a point. You know, uh, to a point, it's a good thing, but all it is is meditation. But a lot of people want to jump on the bandwagon and call it some her uh, heretical thing. But I don't think it is if it's done in the right way. But that's what it talks of. I've mentioned um, Brother Lawrence. Uh, they, they call it, he was such a prayer warrior. And, and that's what he would do. He would just sit and focus on God. He centered every thought on the Father. And that's what it's about. If I can focus, it's encouraging. But there's one thing that, that they talked a lot about in that book that I was reading, and that is this very issue. Our minds wander. It takes off into another direction. And they says, don't let it fret. Don't let it fret you. Just move on. Get back, focus where you need to be, and get going. That's how we have to do it. We have to set our focus where it needs to be. But how many times have we sit down to read God's Word, and all of a sudden I got to, page down and I don't remember what I even read because I just blowed right through it my mind was somewhere else but my eyes were still going through it boy I get mad at myself for that one but then I got to wake me up and I'll see one little sentence or a word that catches my attention I thought well what's he talking about now I got to go back and read the whole thing again because I missed what he was talking about our minds wander but what we see is this, if we let that wander too far, we are distracted to where we never do it again. Now, to me, we got to be careful here because there's one thing that stands out and that's to get to the root of the problem. And that's focus. We have to get our focus where it needs to be. That's the bottom line. If I'm going to pray, I need my focus where it needs to be. My focus needs to be on Christ. If I can set that focus, I'm going to be where I need to be. Now think about this for just a second. If I lose focus, I forget whose I am. That means I forget that Christ is the one I'm speaking with. He's the one that I'm to be meeting with. I'm to sit there and focus on him. I heard one guy talk about this, and, and I have a hard time doing it. It's just not something, I guess, that's in me. He'd set a chair across from him, and he would sit there and pray to that chair because he would picture Jesus sitting in the chair. And I thought, well... That works. That's great. I just feel kind of silly talking to a chair, you know, because that's all I see is the chair. But, but there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing because we're still focusing that Jesus is in that chair. And I don't think that's a big problem. But what I do think is this. I believe that when we lose sight of Christ, we lose the whole thing. We lose the whole thing because we lose sight of the path that we're to be on. I need to do anything that's going to keep me focused on Jesus. So many times when I pray, I begin to focus on mostly Isaiah 6. That's the one I go to. Now I go a lot to, to Revelation 4 as well. But I picture God high up on the throne and the angels singing and his train filling the temple. That's where I want to pray. That's where I want to be. So when I look at that, I'm, a, I'm encouraged by that. But we have to understand that this is nothing new. This is not new, some new ploy of the enemy. I want to go to Jeremiah now. We're going to spend a minute here. Jeremiah 18, 11 through 13. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord. I'd love to be an old prophet. Thus saith the Lord. Could you imagine going into some place and doing that? That'd be awesome. Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now, every one, from his evil way. And make your ways near doings good. Now watch this verse. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. And we will, everyone, do the imagination of his evil heart. Oh, man. 
They just kicked dirt in the face of God. That's all they did. Now, when you look at this and you begin to see it, it's an amazing thing. But I like when I get into Old Testament, uh, compare it to the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint says this. This is how they just uh, translate it. Verse 12, and they said, we will play the man because we will go after our own aversions and each of us will do what is pleasing in his evil heart. I want to center on that word aversions because that word aversions is something that's important to understand. It means this, it's the action of turning away or averting one's eyes. Now, grab that because that means when I live my life, even every single day and I try to pray and my mind goes somewhere else, that's what's taking place. An action of turning away or averting one's eyes. If I'm not praying to God and all of a sudden my mind starts to wander, I've averted my eyes. I've taken my eyes off of God and I lied my mind to take control. And if that happens, we will do the same as these people. These distractions is what caused them to turn from God. They were focusing on God and outward but not on the inward. They had then come to a place where eventually they didn't even focus there. They totally turned from God and they allowed themselves to be involved in anything that they thought could please them. And this is where we get into trouble. We allow something to come to a place that it consumes us. Now I'm good at this, I really am. If I'm making something out in the garage like what I'm doing right now, I have a hard time taking my mind off of that. Because I'm trying to figure something out that I can't figure out. And when I can figure it out, then I'm done thinking about it. I don't have to worry about it no more. But my mind still thinks about that. I sit in my chair and I'm trying to pray. And all of a sudden I'm thinking in about three hours, I'm going to be out there working on that thing. I don't know how I'm going to make this or make that. So I'm trying in my mind have it all made before I get there. But it diverts me from what I'm trying to do at the moment. And this is when it happens. We need to take those diversions and put them away. Now, let's tie this together. Note this scripture then Jeremiah says in verse 15. God said, because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in, the, in paths in a way not cast up. Now, when you look at this verse, it, it, to most of us that look at it and it's kind of hard to understand what he's trying to tell us. But it's, when you really break down the words and you study the words in it, it's, it's pretty simple. Jeremiah, Jeremiah desired them to look at the cost that it was costing them to turn from God. That's what he was wanting them to do. He's saying, hey, pay attention because what you're doing is going to cost you. And he's saying it right here what it's going to cost them because all the burning of an incense that they were doing was nothing. It was nothing. Boy, we can really go off on a trail here. How many people come into church that same way? Come on now, let's get real. How many come to church desiring God? They're so hungry for him that everything they do is focused on him right at this second. Or how many is thinking, hey, we got a party tomorrow. I got to do this. I got to, hey, I got to take care of this. I got to do that. When we should be focusing on God. This is a sad thing. And it's a scary thing. You know, and to me, when I see it, it's sad because of the fact that we all do this. We all do it. But we should be focusing on God so powerfully that nothing can invade our thought process. I've often been frustrated like this because of the fact that we come to church and we sit in church. In our case, we're only here a few hours on Sunday morning and an hour or so on Thursday nights. But it's hard to focus on God just for that little bit of time. I told somebody one time when we was talking about tithing, I says, yeah, you all yammer about tithing money. Let's take this a little deeper. How many of you tithe your life? How many of you tithe your life? Figure it up. I took the time and I figured out how many minutes were in a day times the week. And then give yourself 10% of that going to God. How many of us do that? And I was a pastor and it was hard to do that. Even in the hours of study, even the hours of coming to church. But how many of us take the time to do that? But yet we go through the week and we don't focus on the Father. But he says to ask for the old paths. 
Jeremiah says this in a couple different places throughout the book. But what we realize is those old paths are important. And what he focuses on is right here. They cause them to stumble in their way from the ancient paths. Now, why is that important for us in this study? And it's this. We walk a path that somebody else has already trod. They've already made the journey. I love the book of Hebrews when it gets to chapter 11. We see all those that went before us. They call it the hall of faith. Read it. Read it. All those people paved the way for you to make this path. Now, what Jeremiah is saying here, or God in this case, he says that this path they forgot. They walked away from the path. They came to it that, that where it wasn't something that they saw as important. It says, in a way not cast up. What it's referring to is a road. It's, it's a road that was not worthy of walking. It was a road that was supposed to be elevated that was not. So when they walked this path, they didn't care who came before them. They didn't care the trail that was blazed. All they cared about was just walking in their own way. How hard that makes it. When I raced sled dogs, we always had a, a lead dog, and we, we would say that they would break trail. So we'd always have a bigger lead dog up in front because he was, he was packing the snow. He was pushing through the snow, and you needed that. It made it easier for the other dogs to run, and he would break trail for them. And when we do that, this is what took place in our life. These people that came before us, we can't just push them off and say, yes, they did a great work. No, you build upon their work. You go from what they did and continue it on. We look at Paul. Paul was a great man, a great missionary, but he blazed the trail. He started it, and we continue it on. And that's the way we should live our life. We have to look at our brain. Our brain is an amazing thing. But when it comes to focus, we can understand why it's such an issue. The brain is made up of 70,000 thoughts a day. 70,000 thoughts will go through your brain a day. Can you imagine that? That's a lot. That's a lot. But it's also done with a 100 billion neurons firing in your brain. For every one of those actions that it makes, that many neurons are firing. There's 500 trillion points. They're called synagogues. Synopsis. I knew it was synagogues. But there's synopsis in your brain that these things fly between. All this thing's going on while you're just making one thought. Now you know I trip over my tongue all the time. Mine aren't firing right. But what we see in this is this. These things are firing at 300 mile an hour. 300 mile an hour. All this is taking place in your brain the minute you're thinking about what you're having for lunch. So is it any wonder, is it any wonder that our minds wander? They wander with all this going on. It makes it hard to walk the narrow way, but that's the fight that's before us. If we want to have the success, we learn to control our mind. We learn to control our thoughts. They make patterns. Can we change it? And I believe we can. We change that pattern. Now, every one of you can attest to this because of the fact that before you come to Christ, you didn't care about church. You didn't care about the things of God. But all of a sudden, now you got saved and you now started making new patterns in your life. I started coming to church on Sunday mornings. Now I've made that pattern. I come every Sunday. Then all of a sudden, I started coming on Wednesday nights, and that pattern was set. Now it's just something that I did. Then I went to soul winning every Tuesday night. On and on and on. I formed them patterns in my life. I began to read my Bible. That every day I'd get up and I'd read it, even if I had to suffer to do it. First house I built, we was living in the basement while I built the house. I couldn't read down there because I couldn't turn the lights on because everybody's sleeping. There was no heat upstairs, but I'd go upstairs, wrap a blanket around me, turn a little light on, and I would read my Bible in the cold just so I could read God's Word. It's a pattern that forms that you do not stop. And when you can form that pattern, it begins to change the process of your mind to where you begin to think on the things of God, and you will not be moved. It changes our focus, and that becomes a conviction that we talked about last week that's in my life, that nothing is going to stop me from doing that. Nothing is going to hinder that because that's something that I've built deep and not only in my mind, but into my heart. And when we concede in that way, it makes all the difference in the world. This journey then becomes something that is vital to us. And I'm going to run out of time, so we're going to make a major leap here. 
I do want to look at this scripture before we do far, go further. Don't David. David here says this in chapter 57, verse 7. Now think of this before we even read it. David so many times felt pressure in his life. Could you imagine getting up every day and wanting to think that somebody's going to kill you today? He did. Every day. Before he became king, he was running from Saul. Every day Saul wanted to kill him. How would you like to wake up with that on your mind every day? Even his own men at one point wanted to kill him. But know what he said. 57.7. My heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Oh, man. That is a man that had focus. His focus was on the Father. And his focus was immovable. Now, I want to switch gears here a little bit. I want to see this lived out. You know, so many times we hear people get up and they preach, and, and it's just a lot of words. But I like to give some meat. I want to put some meat to this thing and put some flesh on the bones. Because if we see this in action, it makes all the difference in the world. Now, I want you to look at this scripture. We're going to look at Martha and Mary. Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. Now pay attention to this verse. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and come, and come to him and said, Lord, doest thou not care that, thou, that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she come help me. And Jesus answered her and said unto her, Martha, Martha, Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. This is important because we learn from Martha right here. Now, a lot of people want to be like Martha. I don't. I don't. Because Martha failed many, many times. But the reason why is because of distractions. There was great distractions in her life. If we look at verse 40, we see in this word cumbered. It means to drag all around or distract with care. It's basically something that was weighting her down, a burden that she also had to carry. It's kind of like you put a 40-pound pack on your back and you're walking with it all the time. This is the weight that she carried. Now, I don't know what weight you carry this morning. Now, I don't know what's causing you the distraction, but it is a weight. It's something that will weigh you down to where you will turn your face from God and you will forget him. You will turn aside, and that weight you will get frustrated with at some point. And to me, it's sad to come to this place, but many live their life just like Martha. They live their life this way. From an early age, Martha formed a pattern in her life that all she did was care for her siblings. She is the oldest sister. She had to care for, care for Mary. She had to care for Lazarus. That was her job, her obligation. Her mom and dad must have been gone by this point, and it was up to her to raise the siblings. That's all she knew. Her whole life was focused to care for her family. Now, we say, well, that's a good thing, and it is. But sometimes good things are distractions as well. Because if that distraction, even though it's good, pulls you away from God, what good is it? What good is it? And this is what Martha thought. I believe that Martha formed her whole identity around her work, her service. Now, with that mind in mind, I believe that Martha truly was a devout follower of Jesus. I don't doubt that. I think she was an awesome follower of Jesus. Otherwise, she wouldn't have had him in her house. She would have just told him to go away. But I believe in her heart she wanted to serve Jesus with her whole being. But by the distractions in her life, she couldn't do it. She couldn't place herself to that level. She was the one in the control and she wasn't giving it up. And that's where it's at. Now, how many of us are like that? How many of us do not want to give the Lord the control of my life? Because I can't surrender that. I have to be in control. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you're that way, you better be careful. Because that's a hard road to walk. Because you can't be in control all the time. It doesn't work. And one day, you'll find out that you're not in control. And when you're not in control, what are you going to do? Where are you going to turn? Now, we're going to watch what Martha did. So let's see as we tr progress through this. I believe that her service become her greatest distraction. 
Now, with that thought in mind, she could have placed herself right where she needed to be, but she couldn't do it. I wonder what would have happened if she would have been like Mary and pushed all that aside and sat at the Jesus' feet. Can you imagine her coming next to Mary, snuggled down next to her and see Mary turn at her and smile, Martha smile back at her, and they're both their eyes turned to Jesus because he was the most important thing in the room. No matter what else was taking place, he was the most important thing. But Martha, because of the control that she desired, could not do that. She could, make, she could not make the main thing the main thing. And that's what's sad. And we find ourselves so many times in that situation. But this, what is interesting in this whole scripture is this very mentality that she had. She even rebuked the Lord. This is what blows me away. She even rebuked Jesus. Note this verse again. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care? And that's how she said it. Now, when she came in this way, she knew what is, and this is what's good. She knew enough that she had to go to Jesus. She knew that much. She knew that Jesus was the only one there that could change the situation. I like that. So no matter where we're at in our life and no matter how we are in, in the distractions, we still know where to go. We still know where to go. But it's a matter of how we come. It's a matter of how we come. And this is what Martha couldn't get. She, in this, basically was saying, I am not coming with a humble spirit. I'm frustrated and I'm aggravated and you need to change the situation. She was laying it out to him. Now, if you get into the Greek of all of this, it means that she came with an aggression. She came with a good aggression. And with that, it means that she stepped up to him. You know, it, it's kind of like somebody walks up and throw their chest out and gives you the lean. You know, you all know what that means. It's time to throw down. And that's what she was doing. She was in that position. She burst in or upon Jesus. She was coming with him with attitude. And that does not get you nowhere. It's an expressive term. And she was coming at Jesus with the same way. By this, we must have been something stirring in Martha. Now, I'm not going to throw stones at Martha. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm wanting to open our eyes to see the importance of this. I believe Martha, in her mind, wanted to serve Jesus. I believe that. I believe that with all her heart, she wanted to serve Jesus. But she just could not let go. She could not let go of the distraction. That distraction to serve meant more to her than anything else. That meant everything. I think in her mind, she figured she was serving Jesus by acting that way. But I also believe this. I believe that if she could have got Mary's help, she could have got done quicker, and they both could have sat down with Jesus. But that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. That's still fitting Jesus in when he's on your time. I don't see that. I think we need to put Jesus where he belongs at the focus and the central point of our life, not when I think it's good for me to have that moment. And we must see it in that way. I wonder how different it would have been if Martha would have just sat down with Mary. What a difference that would have made. I think Jesus at this point confronts Mary with what cost her the most. And that's the distraction. Note what he says here. Jesus went right to the root of the problem. He said she was careful, meaning that she was anxious about it. It was to the point, it is all that she dwelled upon, and it stole her peace and joy. Now, when we go to prayer, how much does that steal our joy? When we start thinking about everything that we got to do today, how much does that steal the time we have with Jesus? That time that's his time, that time that we specifically set aside for him. It robs us of that. It robs us of that blessing. Second thing is this. She was as well troubled, meaning disturbed. Jesus was telling her that her mind was in an uproar. And that's what it was. There was so much going on. She had no peace. It was robbing her of everything. And I don't think this happened overnight. I think this is something that Mary or Martha fought for, for a long time. I think she might have even come to a point where she looked back over her life and realized she had no childhood. All I ever did was look after these two. Now they don't even help me. Martha turned from looking at Jesus to the distraction of looking at herself. 
and that never ends well. We can look at other places where Martha was troubled. If you remember back, and I'm not going to take the time to look at it now, but go back and read the story of, of Lazarus at the, at the tomb when Jesus came to raise him from the dead. He had to chastise Martha again because she didn't understand the power of who Jesus was. She believed there'd be a resurrection, but she didn't believe that he, that he could raise him from the dead. She didn't have faith in who he was. We all face distractions of, sh of some shape, some form. Yours will be different than mine because we all face different things from the way we think. But the patterns all must be the same. Martha must have come to a place to overcome them or she would never be a follower of Jesus. I think it's sad we don't know much after, about Mary after, or I'm sorry, Martha, after the incident with Lazarus. You know, and, and when we get to that, it's kind of sad. But Jesus gave uh, Martha a convicting statement here. Now watch, because this was the, the, the advice he gave her, but it was a convicting thing. In Luke 10, 42, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Man, I like that. I like that. If we have a heart for Jesus, nobody will take that away from you. Nobody. And we must stay strong. Jesus told Martha one thing was needful. Now, I like the phrase, and I, and I looked this up, and, and, and it's, it's an awesome thing. It means a requirement. It means to be about a business. That means my business is to serve Christ. My business is to sit at the feet of Jesus. And that's what Jesus wanted Martha to understand. It doesn't matter about your service, Martha. What matters is how you serve me. That's what it's about. I wonder how different this would be if Martha would have come to Jesus in a different attitude. What if she came in a different attitude? What if she come with an idea of, Jesus, I'm serving you. Is there anything else you need at this moment? Rather than, hey, make her help me. Why do I got to do all the work? Man, have we heard that before. I've heard that from so many people. What them do? I do it all the time. Why do I got to do everything? Said that myself a few times. But the thing of it is, is this. Where's the blessing in that? Where is the blessing in that? We find blessing when we're doing out of the love of Christ. She needed to train her brain to focus on Jesus and to push all that other stuff away. And our lives are no different. We have to ask ourselves what is necessary, but most of all, what is important? What is important? You know, it's easy to get wrapped up in these things. It's a simple term that we need to fix. And it's simply this. What am I thinking on? Am I thinking on earthly things or am I thinking on eternal things? You know, the older I get, and I've seen this for a long time, and Marsh has heard me say this many times, you know, we need to quit focusing on, the, on here. We need to focus on the eternal. We all think we got all this time, but every day I lose a day. I'm that much closer to eternity. I better start paying attention to the eternal. I better start paying attention to sitting at the feet of Jesus and knowing that that's where the blessings roll. Note this scripture. I'm about to be close here. Psalms 27, 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That is the blessing of life. That's the needed thing, to sit at his feet and know that we're working in his presence. The distractions will always be there. They are not, you're not going to walk down this path without a distraction. And I can walk down this path after service. And in my mind, I want to get to the door. But I'll talk to Ralph, Marilyn, Brother Glick and Emily, Mike and Joy on my way out. And I miss the rest of the people going out the door. And that's okay. And that's okay. But we all face distractions of many different kinds. But it's a matter, do those distractions rule your life or do you rule them? I pray that we can rule them 
that we will stand forward in our focus for Christ and put that first and foremost. Because I'm telling you what, the greater the distraction that's trying to pull you away is the harder you got to fight. And it's the harder we have to change patterns in our life to not allow them to affect us. We must stand strong. The distractions will come, but we can overcome. Father, we thank you.